on this week in enterprise tech with the real 5g please stand up well att is standing up and they're saying they might charge you more for faster speeds plus brian curtis and i talk with tim tully cto at splunk about data analytics and data migration to the cloud quiet on the set netcasts you love from people you trust this is twit this is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 339, recorded April 26th, 2019. Splunkin' it. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by LinkedIn Talent Solutions. Find the right people for your business this year at linkedin.com slash this week and get $50 off your first job post. And by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Wasabi's disruptive cloud storage technology is helping enterprises solve one of their fastest growing issues, data storage. See for yourself with free unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click free trial, and use the offer code ENTERPRISE. And by WordPress. Turn your dreams into reality and launch your website at wordpress.com. Get 15% off any new plan at wordpress.com slash twit. Welcome to This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreski, your guide through this big world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need some help from some of the top enterprise tech professionals in the industry, starting with our very own Mr. Brian McHenry, Director of Global Security and Solutions of F5 Networks. Bam, great to have you back, man. Yeah, good to be back. A little bit of a long break for me this last time. Now, you've been uh, traveling around. You've been a traveling troublemaker over the past month. Where have you been going? Um, well, you may have heard that uh, F5 acquired a little-known company, Nginx, or actually is uh, in process of doing so. I should be uh, letter perfect on, on my description of where we are. But uh, we've been spending a lot of time uh, getting ready for the hopeful uh, successful completion of the acquisition and uh, learning all we can about Nginx's technology and and how we can bring it to even more customers out there in the world. Fantastic. I love Nginx. I use it all the time. In fact, I've used it on some of the unikernels that I've been messing with. So that's so so much fun. We'll have to have you guys back once it's all complete and we can start talking about it. Cool. Yeah, I look forward to it. Fantastic. Of course, we can't have a twiet without our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin, Senior Editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, welcome back. It is great to be here, Lou. It's always a happy day when I can join the twiet riot from down here in the swamp. It is definitely a happy day to have you here. What, you're you're going to go. You're going to. Uh, where are you heading now? Recently, you're you're heading to not not to ignite. Uh, there's a couple of trade shows you're going to soon, right? Yeah, I was actually at one earlier this week. There was a um, a conference on IoT and AI that uh, IBM threw uh, over on International Drive here in Orlando. A couple of other small things coming up. And, of course, toward the end of May, we've got Interop uh, with its great conference. It's going to be going on. And uh, for those in the Twilight Riot, if they are thinking about going, I still have some uh, discount codes that I can toss around. So they should definitely hit me up via the uh, Twitter and email handles I'll give at the end of the show. Fantastic. Definitely hit up Curtis. You can always use a discount for trade shows like that. Well, folks, we have some pretty great topics to talk about today on today's show. Not only are we going to talk about 5G again, but how your pricing model just might change with it. Plus, we have a great guest, Tim Tilly, SVP, as well as CTO of Splunk. We're going to talk a little bit about data analytics and AI. But before we do that, let's go ahead and jump into this week's blips. Now, don't DNS or D a DNS over HTTPS might just become a regardless, uh, actually become fruition, might regardless of how ISPs and governments feel about it. According to the UK and ISPs are actually required to store a record of which websites citizens visit for the previous 12 months, which is actually done by DNS service's request today. Well, with DNS over HTTPS, it makes it 
almost impossible because these requests are now encrypted. Now, this makes it a lot tougher for British and U.S. governments to monitor this for illegal content for terrorism, as well as an unintended consequence is more technology-based side of, side of things. Is this related to how CDNs work or content delivery networks and actually how they cache things? So I'm actually, it might have a dep uh, an issue with that. Now, how did DNS over HTTPS rise to its current state? Well, it's primarily because of companies like Google, Cloudflare, and it partners Mozilla, promoting privacy. Now, Google is in the process of imp implementing Doe as part of its public DNS system, which will be supported as uh, its point in the world's most popular browser, Chrome, as well as already supported in Android 9. Android 9. Uh, Mozilla has similar plans for Firefox on desktop and mobile platforms. Uh, the public will essentially be force-fed the technology, ultimately ensuring adoption. I don't know about you, but these might be some tasty donuts later on. Oh. Well, if you're looking for good news, you won't find it here. Enterprise Trojans were up 200% in the first quarter of 2019. Enterprise cyber attacks mean big bucks for cyber criminals who were targeting businesses with a wave of Trojans and ransomware attacks through 2018 into the first quarter of this year. Trojan detections on business endpoints in the first quarter of 2019 increased more than 200% from the fourth quarter of 2018 and almost 650% from the first quarter of 2018, according to the Malwarebytes Quarter 1 Cybercrime Tactics and Techniques Report. As an example, the Emotet Trojan has made a total shift, they say, away from consumers as operators focus on business targets, with the exception of just a few outlier spikes. Now, business threat detections have been increasing overall. While there was only a 7% increase between the fourth quarter of 2018 and the first quarter of 2019, Malwarebytes found detections overall were up 235% year over year. And if that's not enough good news, ransomware is also back to business with a 195% increase in enterprise detections between Q4 2018 and Q1 2019, and a 500% increase from the first quarter of 2018 to the first quarter of this year. Now, researchers anticipate that the rest of 2019 will bring more innovations in the ransomware space as cyber criminals, technicians and innovators that they are, find new and exciting ways to target organizations. And in more bad security news, there's a new Drupal vulnerability discovered in the wild. Drupal, the popular open source content management framework, has issued patches for a critical vulnerability affecting both the 7.x and 8.x versions. The bugs were discovered by the Zero Day Initiative Specialized Bug Bounty, the Targeted Incentive Program, which provides over 1.5 million in rewards for specific targets. The vulnerabilities, in this case, enable remote code execution, but it requires a fairly complex set of actions in order to be successfully exploited. Specifically, three malicious quote-unquote image files must be uploaded and then an authenticated administrator must be fished or otherwise enticed to click on a crafted link. These types of chained vulnerabilities have become increasingly common as researchers and attackers alike search for ways to find the most critical exploits which yield either remote code execution or return some sort of sensitive data from the backend systems. Sam Thomas is the researcher who discovered this flaw and submitted to ZDI's bug bounty. Thomas leveraged the research he originally presented at Black Hat earlier last year to exploit a PHP deserialization flaw. Despite the complex multi-step exploitation, it's strongly recommended to patch these flaws as soon as possible. Now, worker productivity is, is always different depending on the organization you're in or the culture it has. But Amazon has always had really high demands for not only its back-end services, but also is for its retail space and warehouse workers. Now, for Amazon, in order to ensure and guarantee some level of productivity, a new report reveals that they're not only tracking warehouse productivity, but can also relieve them from their work if they don't meet the bar. This takes time tracking and productivity tracking to a whole new level. Now, as part of this tracking, Amazon systems track a metric called time off task, meaning how much time workers pause or take breaks. If the system determines that the employee is failing to meet production targets, it can automatically issue warnings and terminate them 
without a supervisor's intervention. Although a human supervisor can intervene, the process to do so is actually quite cumbersome. Now, essentially, the human element is removed from the equation if required. You might want to keep your workspace and your red stapler intact because the system might have other plans for you. Well, there's a new twist on the old Stuxnet story. Remember way back in 2010, Stuxnet sabotaged your uranium enrichment process at the Natanz nuclear facility in Iran. Three years later, researchers at Symantec found what they surmised was a precursor to the known payload that caused the plant's centrifuges to spin out of control and fail. Stuxnet.5, as they called it, targeted the Siemens PLC control systems that operate valves that feed uranium hexafluoride gas into uranium enrichment centrifuges. It could close the valve, disrupt the process, and basically shut down the manufacturing process. Now, this discovery led the Symantec researchers to revise their time frame of the Stuxnet, Stuxnet attack all the way back to 2005, which was two years earlier than the known 27 to 2009 attacks on the Natanz centrifuges. Well, it's now six years after that Stuxnet.5 finding, and there's another twist. Researchers from Alphabet's cybersecurity company Chronicle earlier this month revealed that they have found evidence that a fourth cyber espionage group possibly assisted in Stuxnet's attack campaign on the Natanz nuclear facility. Now, they discovered a link between an older Stuxnet CNC component and an older cyber espionage platform called, of all things, Flower Shop. This was active as far back as 2002, though it was first discovered by Kaspersky Lab in 2015. Notice all of these gaps between action and discovery. Dubbed Stuck Shop by Chronicle, the module communicates with known Stuxnet C2 servers and can eliminate dial-up prompts for machines that aren't connected to the network. This latest discovery adds to what researchers have long known, that Stuxnet was the result of a collaborated framework with a bunch of different groups contributing to a hodgepodge of plugins. The real lesson here, as one researcher said, we really could be missing a bunch of stuff now and only find it years later. Well, the European Union Parliament passed it passed the controversial copyright overhaul earlier this week and a vote of 348 to 274. Ars Technica attempted to explain this maddeningly vague EU copyright uh, with the help of some folks from the Electronic Frontier Frontage. Electronic Frontier Foundation. The legislation is controversial with two provisions receiving the bulk of the criticism. Article 11 aims to help news organizations collect more licensing fees from news aggregators like Facebook and Google News. Article 13 aims to help copyright holders to collect licensing fees from user-generated content platforms like YouTube and Facebook. Critics of Article 13 have argued that the legislation would force technology companies to adopt upload filters and potentially run roughshod over fair use and other user freedoms. The main goal of Article 11, on the other hand, is to prevent automated scraping of news sites. However, the legislation doesn't accomplish this goal by directly regulating scraping of news sites, and neither does it do so by explicitly banning the use of headlines and hyperlinks. As per Danny O'Brien of Electronic Frontier Foundation, I'm sorry if this sounds incoherent. It's because the principle behind it is incoherent. Now, we've had many discussions about whole, how whole corporations are held accountable for leaks, hacks, and data privacy issues. Well, the FCC was also trying to enforce liability as well. Let's see how well they did. According to the latest report, they have lost the fight in a couple of instances. In the case of ClickSense, which is actually a web portal that paid users for completing surveys, watched ads, or performed various other tasks, there was a breach after ClickSense employee downloaded a malicious browser extension on their computer, which actually gave hackers a way inside the company's network. And because of the company, because of this, the company failed to implement minimal security measures. The hackers were able to download the personal data of Click sense to users over 6.6 million of them in total. Now, according to the FCC, FTC, hackers stole full names, date, date of birth, email, and postal addresses, usernames, passwords, and answers to security questions, 
and even their social security numbers. Sound familiar? Well, the hackers who have been identified, ha- who actually have not been identified to this day, uploaded 2.7 million of those records on Pastebin, where everyone could download the data and put the rest for sale on the dark now web. Now, per the settlement, ClickSense and its CEO James Grego must not make false claims about the security and privacy of their service and must obtain independent biannual security assessments. That's it. That's what they got. A slap. Now, the other company I dress up, a website for children. Uh, this company made the exact same mistakes that ClickSense made, storing personal information in clear text with no encryption and suffered the same fate with after two weeks after ClickSense. There was a SQL injection flaw, ultimately giving release to 2.1 million user records over a quarter million below below actually below the children under age, uh, actually for children under age of the of the age 13. Now, the company reached the same no harm done agreement with the FTC as ClickSense, but also agreed to pay an additional $35,000 in civil penalties for COPA violations. Now, as the Yahoo, sell- the Yahoo settlements are proving, the fight is actually real, and so is the restitution. The fighters just have to keep on fighting. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we do, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's LinkedIn Talent Solutions. All right, I'm going to ask you, where are all the professionals at? You know, they're on LinkedIn. If you're ready to hire for whether you're small business, your enterprise, you naturally want to find the best person, the right person for the job. And odds are they're on LinkedIn. It's the world's largest professional network, 70% of the U.S. workforce is on LinkedIn. Some of the biggest names in the industry post content there every day. I post there my job interests, jobs, my interests, technology, everything. My professional network wouldn't really be the same without LinkedIn. Now, that just goes to show you that LinkedIn can really help your business. Post your job where people go every day to make connections, grow in their career, and also discover really good job opportunities. Now, if you used other sites, but they just are, don't feel right, they're clunky, their job responses you don't get from the right people. What I've seen by my job postings on LinkedIn is that LinkedIn's jobs are matched based on skills and background, but they add to that secret sauce recipe by also matching based off of interests, activities, and passions as well. Impressive. Most impressive. What does that mean for your business? Well, it means that LinkedIn will match you quickly with a group that's the most relevant, qualified, and candidates for the job that you're looking to fill. Well, in that way, you can also focus on the candidates you really want to spend time with and you are really excited to, to talk to and hire. Now, if you think about it, there are 500 million pros on LinkedIn every day. LinkedIn is the best way to get your job opportunity in front of the right people at the right time. Why else will customers rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires? It works for you. It gives you the tools that you can target your next generation workforce with laser precision. I bet you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that the new hire is made on LinkedIn every eight seconds. I've used them in the past. It's amazing how fast you can scale your talent acquisition with LinkedIn Talent Solutions. Post a job today at linkedin.com slash this week and get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash this week to get $50 off your first job post. LinkedIn.com slash this week. Terms and conditions apply, and we thank LinkedIn for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, our our audience is familiar with the 5G topic and all the continual controversy that comes along with it. Uh, will, the, will there be a real 5G? Will the real 5G please stand up, or who has the better tech, or how fast will the adoption be? But this past week, the controversy continues. The drama continues with AT&T's announcement of pay for play 5G. This is either a ploy to either create more buzz that AT&T's 5G will be so fast and scalable that you'll need to pay for the scaled up versions similar to home Internet services. Or it could actually be a way for AT&T to generate additional revenue for an already normalized and standardized pricing system for cellular and, and mobile Internet. Well, we'll obviously want to get the opinions of my co-host on that in just a bit. Now, some companies are doing this subtly in their pricing, such as when you stream video or when you tether your device, or most consumers actually don't actually notice that they have a degraded experience in that case. But businesses notice. They notice that latency. Now, the interesting part here is the AT&T is claiming they will offer this tiered pricing model, but they will only start with businesses. Uh, but they might not be considering a couple things. The first thing is, Speeds will vary by location because obviously signal integrity comes into play here, as well as, uh, you know, 
home internet is actually a lot more reliable with that kind of wired internet, obviously. Uh, they also are only focusing on businesses where some businesses might be willing to pay for faster internet, more reliability, but consumers are not used to that. So we'll see how that goes. Now, an interesting spin on this is that T-Mobile is actually calling out that they will not be charging for scaling their 5G services. So this is an interesting spin on this, already creating additional controversy and uh, a lot more um, uh, con uh, issues with that. Um, so I wanted to throw to you guys first. I want to start with the kind of the, hey, what is, is, what is AT&T doing here? Do, are they... Are they basically saying, hey, we're going to be so so fast, so powerful, we can do this because then people pay more for the more reliability, the faster speeds? Or are they just trying to create buzz uh, in hopes that the, nobody notices their uh, their fake icon in the corner of their phone? What do you got? What do you think, Curtis? Start with you. Well, uh, with the the 5G E, I think they're certainly hoping that people pay very little attention to what's actually going on. And with the rest of, of their announcement, um, I think they're basically <clears throat> staying true to the AT&T uh, tradition. Um, AT&T is famous for taking reasonably good technology and pricing it in such a horrible way that uh, no one ever buys it. And uh, I think I could could offer residential um, um, DSL a as one example um, there there were others uh, residential ISDN is probably even more famous because uh, they took what was a at the time a moderately fast service but one that could be delivered over uh, standard copper uh, and they priced it in such a way that it pretty much guaranteed that no sane person would would buy it. Um, and I think they're going to do some of that here. My suspicion is that once the other carriers start rolling out 5G in any sort of, of wide distribution, uh, we're going to see some fairly rapid changes in 5G pricing, both for businesses and for consumers. But um, I really think that we're looking at least uh, 24 to 48 months down the line before any anything like that happens. Makes sense. I do agree. I think this is kind of the AT&T way of doing things. They do this with their home internet. Now they're trying it with mobile internet. The interesting thing here is they are targeting businesses first. Brian, I want to throw this to you. Is this just one way of AT&T trying to get this acceptance of this model? Because our businesses are willing to pay the extra mile to get the reliability and the speed that they need. Um, this might just be a way back into that pricing model for mobile internet, maybe? I, I tend to agree. I think um, there's significant uh, investment by all these carriers in upgrading their infrastructure, right? They, they roll out, you know, 4G, LTE, then, you know, this true 5G that's that's in parts of, you know, 19 U.S. cities, um, it, it's not it's not free, right, for them to do this, right? It's all, and, and the way that the, the economic models work right now is that um, AT&T and Verizon and others are, when they upgrade their networks, they're doing it as a competitive advantage over one another, not at present time to, you uh, be able to charge more. So how does how do you maintain a profitability when you're dumping, you know, probably billions of dollars? I'm I'm guessing into infrastructure over a period of time, and and not be able to charge your customers more. And and really the the big thing that you hear talked about in the world of mobile is is customer churn, right? Whether it's you know business customers or um or or residential or you know you know consumers. So. How do they, you know, the thing they've been fighting to date is, you know, how do I maintain customer loyalty? And a lot of that's by, you know, boasting the best network or the best pricing. Um, as they dump more money into these infrastructures, they have to come up with pricing models that will get them, uh, you know, a return on that investment, so to speak. So, you know, coming up with a tiered pricing model, I think 
you know, this was untenable before because um, they couldn't guarantee speeds or performance uh, on previous generations of, of wireless technology, be it 4G or LTE or what have you. Uh, now with 5G, they're going to have a lot more uh, ability to tier performance and also provide performance guarantees, perform, per, per, actually provide actual SLAs. And not only that, that the, the levels of performance that they're going to be able to offer actually is something that could be used in an enterprise use case. It's not just for a mobile handset anymore. It could actually service a whole uh, business location, not just you know a, an individual user. So the, I think they have to, um, as they roll out true 5G networking, they have to target enterprises first and not so much worry. They're really not concerned with end users. You know, I, I find Kurt's reference to ISDN pretty funny. He's a uh, my father actually uh, provisioned an ISDN, a bonded pair of PRIs to our house back in the mid nineties, uh, just so he could work from home more effectively. And um, yeah, it was very expensive, but it was paid for by the company. And um, it was something that, you know, I think, you know, the at and the providers of the world made money off of that by selling it not to the end user consumer, but to, you know, businesses uh, who are looking to get things done in novel ways. And so I think, you know, we're, we're everybody, you know, we're, we're there's such a blurred line between um, consumer use of mobile devices and mobile data and, and the enterprise use that we tend to think, oh, the next big network upgrade is is going to be for the end user consumer, but I don't think that's the case here. I think it's a a misperception in the in the in the consumer marketplace that five G is for them. It wasn't built for them. Right, right. I think you, you bring up an interesting point. I want to throw that, this back to Curtis because I think that the interesting thing here is that you're right. I think that the tiered approach it's actually accepted today. I in fact. I even pay for a tiered approach in my home internet because uh, of uh, Comcast business. They give you a node priority. They give you more reliability. They give you uh, they give you um, a bunch of securities around when you know SLA and so on. And so I would tend to pay for more because I need more reliability there. Um, and so it does make sense for them to target business. But the interesting kind of thing here, and I want to get to this first with you, Curtis, is the fact that T-Mobile is calling it, hey, we won't do this, but we also are not targeting rural areas with our 5G. But AT&T hasn't said that yet. So this, the interesting thing is, Curtis, what do you think? Is this just a way for AT&T to fund more network expansion, maybe? You know, I, I think they definitely are going to use this to to fund the network expansion. And and that's a, an interesting point that T-Mobile has, has brought up, because the fact is, that 5G is not a great rural technology. It is many things, but a long throw wireless is not one of them. I mean, if you look at the way that a lot of uh, these companies are talking about deploying uh, 5G, they're talking about putting microcells essentially on every light post, uh, every utility pole uh, throughout an area rather than just in the large cell towers that we've gotten used to. Uh, once you have that as your deployment model, then all of a sudden deploying it out to rural areas really doesn't make sense. Now, where the, I think it will be a true game changer is ultimately in some of the smaller cities. And there are a lot of those that are, you know, let's be honest, still bandwidth deprived compared to the larger urban areas. So I think it is going to make a difference there. Um, and I don't have a real problem with the idea of a company charging more for a business deployment, especially when they do have to factor in things like the SLAs. Um, you know, a fair amount of the cost isn't the bandwidth. It's the SLA that they that they bring with it. And uh, uh, thinking about BAM's father-in-law, um, you know, 2B plus D, the, the two bonded channels with uh, a, a small control channel was the standard residential model. But um, ISDN was not totally bad. When I was running a lab in the mid-70s, uh, mid-90s, uh, I was paying for PRI. That was uh, 24B plus D. And uh, we felt like we were, were kings of the world with that kind of bandwidth. 
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I remember those days. I remember those days. Well, that does it for that bite. I do want to go to the next bite because you have a very interesting story, and the Nigerians might have uh, Nigerian ISP might have hijacked the internet here. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to note that, uh, as far as we know, absolutely no Nigerian royalty was involved with this. <laughs> now, back in November, uh, November 12th to be specific, a very small ISP in Nigeria that made a mistake while updating their network infrastructure. And in doing so, they provided a great lesson about the brittleness of the internet infrastructure. So <clears throat> what they did essentially was mess up their BGP routing tables. Um, border gateway protocol, BGP, is how routers talk to one another. And without going too far off in the weeds, basically it is the protocol that routers use to tell one another where the best routes exist. So they'll talk about network congestion. There are some algorithms when you get into things like software defined networking for doing some very dynamic switching around congestion. But, but these are serious, serious making your head hurt kind of protocols. They're easy to get wrong and that's exactly what this particular uh, ISP did in Nigeria. And it was the Internet Exchange Point of Nigeria, which is something that every country has. Internet Exchange Points uh, are, are common, especially in developing countries, because they provide a central location for regional ISPs to peer with each other and share data at a reduced bandwidth cost. We tend to see those in North America among things like uh, university consortia. Uh, if Chebert were on, I'm sure he could, could tell us a great deal about these. Now, there are peering agreements among all of these, and those are put into practice through BGP. But what happened in the case of this incident was all of a sudden a wrong number was typed in for an address, and they sent... Um, their routes, they announced Google's prefixes, uh, 212, to other B, their BGP neighbors, including China Telecom. So all of a sudden, all of the traffic going to Google and all of the traffic going to another service called Cloudflare was routed through Russia, into China, and finally into Nigeria. Now, Cloudflare picked it up pretty quickly, and they updated their routing topology, topography to mitigate the problem. But um, a lot of people who tried to get to Google for over an hour, 74 minutes, their customers would try to search by Google and they would end up going to the most stiff censorship engine in the world. Now, <coughs> this was ultimately fixed. There was no malicious intent, but it did point out just how brittle things can be. Now, the good news is that there is a technology fix out there, something called resource public key infrastructure, or RPKI, uh, uses certificates to authenticate BGP route advertising. So it wouldn't allow for a small Nigerian ISP to suddenly start advertising Google's routes. <clears throat> now, route origin validation related confirms that any of these advertisement prefixes come from the actual order owner. The bad news is that only 13% of advertised prefixes use RPKI and less than 1% use the technique to validate route advertisements. So the good news is we have a fix. The bad news is that statistically no one's using it. 
So let me turn to my co-host, and and Bam, I'm going to go to you first because you deal with some fairly serious network juju in your job. Um, what do you think about these fixes? Do you think that these are the s sorts of things that people will be able to implement and will be incented to implement sooner rather than later? Well, I think uh, the long history of, of BGP being at the heart of major internet outages uh, will will incentivize people to try to do something. But um, I'm reminded of the old adage that it's very hard to lay rail for a train that's uh, currently running on that track. So that's that's the concern, right? Is like, how do you fix a widely used protocol while everybody's still using it? Um, is is it as simple as coming up with a new protocol and then asking everybody to switch over and adopt it? Um, we see that that's a struggle to get people to do it with less critical uh, protocols like HTTP and TLS. That you know, dragging people forward into a more secure, higher performance version of a of an existing protocol is always uh, a challenge. So I'm I'm not exactly sure how we uh, incentivize people uh, other than you know you know, turn to legislation, unfortunately. Well, speaking of the legislation, um, Lou, I, I'll come to you. Is this that you deal with software updates and in the whole uh, DevOps way of looking at the world, is it time to treat all of this BGP routing as software and say that, you know, as of, Midnight UTC on July 1st, everyone must implement these new to, uh, protocols. Uh, do you think that's the sort of thing it's going to take? And and is there any chance in the world of that kind of thing happening? <laughs> you know, it just it takes one group like like takes companies like Cloudflare, Google, all these kind of companies that are doing IS that are actually ISPs as well. Um, to kind of force that adoption. I think that that's the key is a lot of them are forcing, we talked about in the blips today, they're forcing DNS uh, over HTTPS. They're forcing that kind of model. I think the same goes here. I think that once these companies put the dollar to the metal and start actually applying these things by default, um, things that won't adopt. And I think that's the key. Now, whether we can do it at a software layer or not, that's the question is, I think really it's going to take some adoption first before we can say, hey, we're going to start putting the foot down and, and forcing people into that model. A perfect example is how Chrome just recently started blocking websites uh, for a particular version of TLS or, 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 or websites who don't even have HTTPS, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's a perfect example of, of, of a company that knows they have a large brow browser share, a market share, and they can make and force at a software layer uh, customers and consumers to do the right thing as well as force companies start hosting the right way. Um, and so I think, yes, I think that could happen. Will it happen fast? No, because this is much lower layer uh, within the ne network set of protocols, as well as um, it's going to take a lot more dollars to adopt. But we will see. Um, I am hoping that over time, especially companies like Cloudflare uh, that are on Google who are pushing privacy, will hopefully also push this uh, and the BGP protocol to a better solution. Well, I, th I think that what we run into here is the basic conflict between the essentially open uh, and b poorly regulated uh, history of the Internet versus what's going to have to happen if the Internet is to conti continue to expand and be a little less brittle. Uh, I'll make a bold prediction here. This is not the last time we will use the letters BGP in a story on Twyatt, uh, but maybe next time uh, it'll be around a little bit better news. Well, that's it for this bite. So Lou, I'm gonna turn it back to you because I'm looking forward to hearing from our guest. Absolutely, and before we get to our great guest, drop some knowledge on the Twyat Ride, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Now I've used Wasabi and they are just awesome. You might have to say, well, cloud storage is expensive. The more you store in it, the more times you perform operations on it and the more times you access it. Well, in this day and age, that's actually quite true. That's the story for most cloud storage companies. Plus, as part of the cloud storage competition, it, some of the other 
uh, cloud storage providers see how low they can go on those storage fees and ingress and egress fees. Well, from experience, I can tell you that if you go cheaper on some of those things, sometimes you also give up on performance and reliability as well. Well, Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage has a way to fix all that stuff. If you're doing just whether small personal projects or all the way up to enterprise projects, Wasabi has seemed to figure it all out. Now, listen to this cost, $5.99 per terabyte per month plus listen to the the game changer unlimited free egress for your data and no charge for api calls so you don't have to pay for actually accessing your data plus you you have to worry about those credit operations go check it out right now what you're already paying on your cloud storage right now because i can tell you that not having to include those egress fees those api calls for those credit operations will substantially save you money on the cost of doing business now i probably think well if they're cheaper, they must be slower, or they don't have as many features or bells or issues, right? Well, Wasabi has developed some disruptive technology, and they found ways to pull raw performance out of their storage devices without compromising on performance and reliability. They have revolutionized the process that lays data on disks sequentially as opposed to blocks. And what happens? Well, that means Wasabi storage is 80% cheaper and actually six times faster from some of the leading industry providers. Is your organization worried about compliance? Well, Wasabi is also worried as well, and they're going to help you with both HIPAA, FINRA, and CJS compliance all the way through. Now, fast, cheap storage isn't worth much if you if it's not secure, and if it's not reliable, well, Wasabi has the answer as well. Wasabi offers a unique feature called immutable buckets, and it can actually allow you to not have to delete it or alter your data, protecting that valuable data from accidental malicious destruction. Now, if you can find other services that are doing that, good luck. Now, see if you can find the fact that they're also doing a 90-day integrity check, as well as they have 11 nines of durability. 11 nines. That's a lot of nines for durability. Now, are you worried about data migration? Well, they also have that solution for you as well. They have a Wasabi ball transfer appliance. It's a Netgear device and it's designed to transfer large data sets and dramatically reduce your cost to migrate. Now you're already already using cloud storage today or your organization maybe has tried to store data on premise to save money or wants to store it partially in the cloud. Well, with Wasabi, it might have you rethinking those approaches. I bet you if you want to try it right now, it'll literally prove to you that you can get to the web and get to the cloud without having to cost too much. Go build something right now for fun or move data right now. Experience Wasabi for yourself with free unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click the free trial link and enter that code enterprise. See how much storing in the cloud can save your business. That's wasabi.com and enter the code enterprise. And we thank Wasabi for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the show. We get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on our Twyer Riot. And today we have Tim Tully, SVP and Chief Technology Officer at Splunk. Tim, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, our audience, they love to hear origin stories. And can you maybe take us through the journey of you through tech and what brought you to Splunk? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, before I came over to Splunk, uh, I was at Yahoo for almost 14 years. Um, I was running most of the, the big media properties that you would think of as sort of being Yahoo. Um, Yahoo Finance, Yahoo.com, um, Tumblr, and then the acquired uh, AOL properties as part of the Verizon acquisition. So Huffington Post, um, AOL.com, et cetera. Um, but before that, I was sort of the, the chief architect in running a lot of the big data engineering teams. So my background is squarely rooted um, in big data. Um, going all the way back to before really the big data term, um, starting in 2003. Uh, before that, a few startups, one got acquired by Oracle, and then before that, Sun Microsystems in the mid to late 90s working on, on Java. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, Tim, we've had Splunk on many times in the past, over the many years. In fact, one of our original uh, seasons of This Week Enterprise Tech, we had Splunk on. But I'd, I'd like to, maybe you could tell the folks at home, obviously Splunk has evolved over the many years. Can you maybe take, tell the folks at home, like what is Splunk in 2019? Yeah, sure. Um, well, it started off largely as a log analytics tool, and uh, it was it's, it's really, really flexible. We have a proprietary programming language um, for writing queries that's very similar to, say, set and awk on the Unix command line. Um, it's really, really powerful, especially in the IT space. And our users largely took us into security and, and IT monitoring. And so um, 
before I joined, you could, you could think of Splunk as being mostly a large big data analytics platform with premium apps that sat on top, um, both in enterprise security and our, our other flagship app, ITSI. Um, largely, those are our two biggest apps that our users love to use. And of course, we have the indexing and query engine that sits underneath uh, powering those. Um, in terms of where we're headed, uh, there's a lot more that we're doing uh, to fill out the big data platform story. There's some announcements that we had at our big user conference um, last October around adding stream processing capabilities, around making mobile, and sort of this this consumerization of the enterprise initiative that you're starting to see pop up in the valley a lot um, become very real for our, for our users. Great. So uh, one of the big, actually you kind of mentioned this while you were uh, talking there, and one of the big powers that are behind Splunk is the ability to kind of pull structured data out of unstructured data at scale, at big data scale. What has kind of changed over the years as d different types of data have come, both from on-premise to online, and different types of data structures have come through? Has Splunk had to change that kind of model uh, to ensure that scalability? And you know, what kind of data are they seeing that's new? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Quite honestly, not a lot. Uh, our platform is so powerful and so flexible that we can really uh, handle all sorts of incoming data, uh, irrespective of the, of, the, of the structure of the data. Um, we do have a, a plugin ability uh, using our so-called technical add-on uh, plugin architecture, uh, where a lot of our developers and users um, actually extend the ingest capability of Splunk to be able to accommodate any data format, um, including binary. So. Splunk really is uh, a super, super powerful platform, and um, I think you, you see that in, in sort of the ubiquity of the, of the platform in terms of its usage. It, it pops up in all kinds of vertical use cases. Right. Now, one thing that we're noticing, obviously, there's some executives in the wild here that are saying, hey, this is the fourth industrial revolution. It's being driven by machine learning and AI. How has Splunk kind of taken on that, and how, do they, how are they uh, using the data they have to produce more and more insights. Are they using machine learning? Are they going forward on AI as well? Yeah, so um, Splunk has basically two channels of investment in machine learning. One is uh, we have a product called the Machine Learning Toolkit. Um, that's an application that users can install for free and become essentially powerful data scientists on top of data that's already sitting inside Splunk. Um, in terms of, of how we apply use cases for machine learning, um, largely that's, that's governed by where our users take us. And what I'm seeing a lot from our customers is that people want AI and machine learning um, to be sort of augmentative and almost automatic in terms of, of how it's, it shows up in the application. So they, they don't want ML in their face per se. They don't have to really want to think about training models or fit and apply. They actually want it to be part of the everyday experience in the same way that um, Netflix would recommend movies to, to you based on previous viewing history. Um, our users want to see, you know, security uh, enhancements and, and suggested queries show up sort of automatic, automatically, if you will. <laughs> Makes sense. I think that the interesting thing here is um, a lot of people already have known, uh, obviously Splunk has very good uh, high-level predictive analytics, um, and now they're starting to get more into anomaly detection. Um, are there different facets of the market that you're targeting more now that as the kind of the industries change and more and more people are moving to the cloud? Yeah, definitely. Um, we're, we're certainly thinking about more real-time use cases, especially with applied machine learning in the stream. Um, I think there's an opportunity to do a lot better with anomaly detection as a major use case, as you said, and, and making that more real-time. And I'm, I'm quite fascinated by the idea of, of real-time machine learning, and that, that's certainly a humongous investment for us. Now, um, my co-host, they didn't want me to ask about this, but there's a whole concept of the security incident event management systems and how there's a lot of kind of players in the market today uh, but it seems that the Splunk just has the data to do this. Is this something that you guys are focusing on? Is it a part of the market that will become more and more, uh, more and more prominent as you guys work through? Yeah, I mean, Sim is certainly uh, a focus for us as a company. Um, I think of, of less of in terms of just that we have the data, but more in terms of uh, how our customers want to see the Sim evolve in the future. So increasingly, we're seeing people want hybrid versions of, of Sim where it sort of straddles cloud and on-prem. We're seeing a, a need for pure uh, cloud-native versions of the SIM. And of course, we'll continue to focus fairly heavily on our on-prem SIM. Um, but I'm, I'm actually interested in not just facets of how the SIM is going to evolve, but in terms of the usability of the SIM. Right. Um, I think it's, it's quite intriguing to start to, to blend together consumer elements of, of mobile computing um, with enterprise. And so a large, a large portion of what we're doing as a, as a company is, is pushing a lot of our, our products 
um, into being not just web products, but also mobile products at the same time. So I'm really aggressive, aggressively chasing the idea of having sort of a mobile SIM in your pocket, um, <laughs> say on your mobile phone or, or on a tablet, and the idea that you can sort of have it as a second screen experience and, and carry that SIM with you everywhere. Makes sense. Now, there were some original announcements, like, for instance, I know that the IoT market is becoming bigger, larger. A lot more organizations are, are, are putting their assets on IoT. Um, there was the concept of Splunk Industrial Asset Intelligence. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that and what kind of Splunk's kind of done for the market uh, in IoT? Yeah, so Splunk is perfectly built to satisfy these IoT IoT type use cases. Oftentimes, you'll hear us being um, sort of the champion in terms of machine data processing. And you think about the evolution of IoT, it's really moved from sort of collecting data from vending machines, which is sort of the silly use case, to really strongly powered edge computing devices um, that operate in the, in the field all over the place, in the oil rigs, in, in industrial manufacturing scenarios. So you can imagine a case where there's use cases for people to push all that um, very deep machine data into a product like Splunk that can really deal with flexible flexible types of data and then analyzing it and have st- having statistics on it. And um, that's essentially what our industrial asset intelligence product does is it it renders uh, views and metrics on top of that machine data. And it, it, it's quite honestly a perfect use, ca- use case for Splunk. Now, to kind of go back to the IoT scenario, and you kind of brought up, hey, there's a lot of devices out there today. But I remember actually Splunk on the show years back, and they were talking about, hey, we're in, the, we work with the Coke freestyle machines already. We take the data, we ingest it, we provide analytics. So you guys have been doing it for quite a while. The interesting thing part here is you're more generalizing this more as a solution for customers, basically. Yeah, I, customers. I think. Again, this is another case where our customers are sort of helping us understand where to go as a company. And our, our customers are increasingly using Splunk um, for data lake type use cases and then building um, not only uh, suites that use our premium applications, but their own applications on top of the platform. So it's really more about where the customer's needs are with their respective data that's, that's sort of taking us in that direction. Makes sense. Yeah, and so it brings it to my next kind of segues into my next question is that, you know, working at a company who definitely ships platforms and services, I know that sometimes customers don't really know uh, or know how to fund uh, building kind of piecemealing platform and services together to kind of make a solution. Um, what is Splunk doing to provide more of out of box solutions for customers, make it easier for them to understand, hey, I'm already funneling data in here, but I need uh, end to end solutions to provide me, whether it's security or um, a visibility into my network, so on and so forth. Are you providing more solutions nowadays as well? Um, definitely in the developer space. So there's a, a very large effort in the company at the moment to to start to tr- provide a better developer experience um, for our consumers. So there's a humongous focus on building better APIs. We're providing the same widgets and uh, UI componentry that our own developers use and trying to treat the platform not just as a first party, but also a third party to, uh, platform um, as it already is today. Uh, we do have uh, a sort of marketplace, if you will, um, called Splunk Base. It has many, many thousands of apps that sit on top of it. Most of them are free. And we're going to really think about taking that to the next level, especially as we, we traverse over to the cloud in a more concerted way. Fantastic. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more with Tim Tully. Also, I'm going to bring in our co-host to, to drop some questions as well. But before we do, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is WordPress. Now, whether you are building a blog or a website, for me, I use WordPress. Even if it's for you or your organization, if you have something to say or an idea and you want to get it out, WordPress is going to make it easy for you. Now, when I have time to blog, WordPress was my platform of choice. In fact, I started with the free tier. Uh, and then I wanted a, a little bit more masterful wizards and, and take me through more custom site features and so on and so forth. And that was actually made more available. So better support was made available with the premium. But it was really easy to migrate and really easy to get there. Now, over time, as my site grew, I paid with that paid tier, but it was really easy to switch. Now, WordPress really made it easy for me to get up and running fast, whether it was the free or, or the paid tier. Uh, and it was both for my personal use as well as we've used it uh, at the organization level as well. Now, WordPress can literally handle that complete spectrum of features, scale, and creativity. Now, one of the most powerful features of WordPress is its plugin capabilities. Now, when you uh, want a social stream on your as a plugin or you want to ensure your posts or content are advertised over social media, you use a plugin. Now, uh, don't take my word for it. Go check out this this stat. Actually, WordPress is literally powers 33 percent of the internet. That's over one third of the internet is now powered by WordPress. Leo has been using WordPress for over 12 years. Check out LeoLaporte.com. But there are millions of other people and tons of large enterprise organizations 
powering their websites by WordPress too. Now, I, I've actually been at to some of the WordPress conferences, developer conferences, where there's implementers, designers, and front-end masters alike, and I love to attend those because there's some really, they're really informative conferences, plus you get to see all the latest and greatest technology out there. In fact, some of the most advanced front-end developers and masters of design work and work on WordPress and to continue to use the platform today. Now, this the great thing is the platform is not just for developers and front-end masters. If you have an idea and you want to get it out there, WordPress can get you started super fast with both their free and their paid tier. With powerful site building tools, thousands of themes, and 24-7 support for real experts, WordPress.com lets you ensure and pursue whatever it is you want to love by launching a site that's free to start with room to grow. No two-week trials, no hidden fees, and WordPress users own their content forever. Join the ranks of over a million people uh, and all the millions of people who use WordPress each day to share with us their vision and ideas. For you loyal listeners, we have a way to sweeten a deal for when you use WordPress. We give you 15% off any new plan and great way to start and room to grow. Go to wordpress.com slash twit for 15% off any new plan purchase. That's wordpress.com slash twit for 15% off your new website. Wordpress.com slash twit and we thank wordpress for their support of this week in enterprise tech well folks we're talking with tim tully cto at splunk and svp uh, i do want to bring my co-host in really quick um i'm going to start with curtis curtis do you have uh, a question for tim oh i have lots of questions for tim um, <laughs> i've talked to splunk many times uh through the years they're a company that uh, i i know well um, and, and Tim, here's one of my questions. You know, you've been talking about IOT and as the, the network traffic from increasingly sophisticated sensors and increasingly powerful edge processors grow, many people are talking about both the performance and security implications of the data flowing back and forth between the edge and the cloud or the on-premise uh, server where analytics are done. Do you see ultimately more of the analysis happening out on the edge? I've heard some people call it fog computing, which I think is a fairly inelegant term. But with the idea of doing some of the, the basic um, analytics out on the edge and only shipping those analytical products back and forth between the edge and the core. What what do you think about that that possibility in terms of an analytics architecture? Uh, I, I think it's it's more than a possibility. It's it's already happening. Um, we we're definitely focused on those types of use cases. We see our customers actually telling us exactly and precisely what you just mentioned is there's a deluge of data coming from these these edge devices that are becoming increasingly powerful. And in turn, what they're doing is generating a lot more data, obviously. And so I think it's actually a, a multi-tier problem. Not only does there have to be some sort of edge processing to ETL the data and perhaps even pre-aggregate it and filter it before it's shipped um, to the actual backend servers, as you mentioned, but there's another layer where those backend servers have to become more powerful in their own right and to be able to process that do the deluge of data in a way that's, that's timely and efficient. Um, the other thing that, thing that I think that's going to actually change is the way that sims actually behave. Um, no longer will they be purely based on aggregating log data and in ingesting events in real um, in batch. It's actually become more of a real time problem. So you'll see sims become much more powerful in the stream processing realm to be able to, to deal with that volume of data from those IoT devices. Well, as as we're talking about the the division of intelligence between the edge and and the core, take it to the next step. Um, you're seeing an awful lot more products come out that enable machine learning or or artificial intelligence type processing on single board and and small remote computers. I mean, everybody from Nvidia to Intel to TI to Sony have products of this sort. Can you imagine a future where you've got this sort of distributed intelligence that, that is at work? Or, or is that the kind of thing, the kind of uh, swarm and hive mind that's, that's uh, pretty far down the road? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that's probably in the future at some point, but not 
in the in the very very near term because really what you need is a, a lower bound on the amount of data before you can start to recognize threats right and it's it's very hard to do it at the individual device level you need not only the device from that the data from that specific device but to be able to see data from other devices um, in, in that same tier uh, before you can really start to good, get a good feel for threats. And so I think that'll come. That's probably the future, but it, it's not uh, something that I think is imminent. Cool. And Bam, you had a, another question as well, right? Yeah. So one of the things that I hear when I talk to F5 customers uh, about SIMs and what are they doing with SIM data and, and, he, and really all their data lakes internally, not just SIM, is – they're they're doing more with it, right? More analytics. They're taking tools like Splunk and applying them and saying, I'm getting more insights from the data that I'm collecting. But the next step that I, I see asked for, and I'm wondering, you, you mentioned that Splunk is putting a lot of work into instrumenting APIs and, and making things more cloud friendly and, and getting more real time. One of the real time functions that I'm seeing a lot of call for, and the, the SIM seems like a logical hub or pivot for this is, all right, I, I've captured that something is happening. You know, I've got you know a few different inputs coming from a firewall, from an IPS, from a, a, a server over here, and and because we've got some intelligence on your platform, uh, I know something is happening. I've I've detected an anomaly, identified a threat, what have you. The next step is is really to say, all right, what's the immediate remediation action I can take uh, through some sort of API call? So rather than instrumenting thinking of 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 in, inputting to splunk as a platform thinking of splunk as as a as an orchestration point uh, and and maybe firing events or requests or new configuration actions or policy changes from the the splunk platform is that something that you guys are giving thought to well, given that you're in the security space over at F5, I'm sure you're intimately familiar with our, our acquisition of, of Phantom, um, which yes. we, we completed last year. And I think that's that's essentially the question that you're asking. And so uh, Phantom has been amazing for us. It's been an amazing acquisition. We're really excited with, with having that team here and the set of customers that are brought with us. Um, so clearly, I, 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 th I, I believe very strongly in the source space. That's why, that's why we moved and partnered with Phantom so closely. Um, so I see that orchestration and automation problem, um, not just as a massive opportunity in the security space, but something that could be extended more broadly beyond just security, right? You can imagine orchestration automation uh, spanning the entire enterprise. And that's that's definitely something that, that we're looking at pretty closely. So when will that ship? Uh, so <laughs> you're not going to be able to pin me down on specific dates here, but it's definitely uh, something that we're working on. Awesome. So... Uh, is that something that you'd also, uh, you know, you, you talked about outside of the space? Are you look, thinking, you know, the IoT space as well? I mean, I think that's an area where, you know, IoT has tended to be like the set it and forget it kind of environment. And and something like this, uh, a real SOAR or automation orchestration solution uh, targeted in the IoT space could help us, you know, stop things uh, that we've seen in the past couple of years, like the build outs of these massive botnets. You can imagine um, a, a properly or instrumented uh, orchestration being a, a way to to thwart these things before they take off like wildfire. Yeah, m most definitely. Um, I, I'm looking at the problem more as a platform problem. And you know, what are the ways that we can take orchestration and automation and make it a generalized platform that can be used across any set of use cases, whether it be security or IT um, or IT. And really, the secret to that is is having really great APIs that are easy for for developers and users to use and um, you know that that's that's a humongous focus as I as I keep mentioning for what we're doing as we continue to uh, have Phantom be part of the Splunk family. Uh, that's really exciting. Uh, that's all I've got for him, Lou. How, back to you. Thank you very much. So I do want to. We're getting close to the end here. We're getting running out of time, but I do want to ask just a little bit about competition. Now I know the market uh, Splunk's been in the market for a long time. They've been kind of the player, the the front runner here. Now, just recently, there's been some some new players kind of jump in on different facets of the market. Um, one being um, is a company called Jask, um, where they're basically focusing on the seam side of things. Um, I'm sorry, it's the sim side of things. Of course, there's the Azure Sentinel with Microsoft Custo uh, and Google's Chronicle. Now, what are you seeing that, that Splunk's been doing for a while that, hey, they're trying to adopt as well? And maybe some areas that you haven't gone yet. Yeah, so... Um 
look, those are those are all interesting companies, and uh, you know, competition definitely breeds innovation. Is, is how I see it. And so, um, some of the themes that I'm seeing pop up, um, especially with the advent of some of these companies, are, are largely having to do with um, migration to the cloud and the ability to process some of the events in a lower latency. And so, it's it's nothing that's necessarily surprising. Um, but what it does is it helps us stay focused and it helps us to really push the innovation curve and, and spend more time with our customers and, and do a, a much better job of, of, of really delivering value and new features. And um, in terms of what we're doing beyond uh, things that s- some of our competitors would do, I, I still feel very strongly, like I keep saying, um, mobile will be at the heart of what, how our consumers use Splunk and how they consume Splunk data. Um, and, and I think that's definitely an opportunity for us to start to differentiate from some of the other users, and um, we'll continue to push that very hard. Fantastic. Tim Tully, SVP and Chief Technology Officer at Splunk, thank you so much for being here. Unfortunately, we're running a little low on time, but before we close up, I wanted to kind of give you a chance to tell the folks at home where they can learn more about Splunk, Splunk where they can go to try things out, where they can get started, how can organizations get on board? Yeah, definitely visit Splunk.com. Um, there's There's... Places and many, many links in there to download free trial versions and, and get started. Um, a lot of a lot of our users actually run Splunk locally on their laptop, and they Splunk all kinds of exotic things. Uh, I personally Splunk my machine, my washing machine at home, to uh, <laughs> look at the volume of water that I'm using because I wash too many clothes because I have I have a bunch of kids and they make a lot of dirty clothes, and so it's just sort of a fun pet project. Um, but it's something that you can run on your laptop and be up in a few minutes, and it's easy to push data into Splunk. We have a HTTP-based event collector that makes it super, super easy, and we automatically recognize uh, logs of all formats um, right off the bat. And so I would definitely encourage uh, your listeners to go out there and uh, try Splunk today. You'll be, you'll be up in a few minutes, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Fantastic. Definitely, definitely try that out. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the Best Staying Enterprise podcast in the universe, according to 9 out of 10 pieces of unstructured data. But I want to make make sure show we thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-hosts in crime, starting with Bam, Mr. Brian McHenry. Uh, Bam, where can the folks at home find you and all of your work? Um, so follow me on Twitter at B.A. McHenry. You can also head on over to devcentral.f5.com and you'll find stuff from me and all my cohorts at F5 and even a way for you to get engaged with the F5 community. Now, if you want to find me in person and you happen to be in Miami next week, I will be at Infiltrate Con, which is a, a you know one of these hyper local, really cool security conferences. I don't usually get to go as an attendee. Usually I'm, I'm there uh, representing F5, but this time I get to go and attend talks and maybe get a little bit smarter and bring some of that back to uh, the Twyat Riot. Fantastic. We love bringing, dropping knowledge on the Twyat Riot. Of course, we, we have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Frank, and he's dropping knowledge on us each and every week. Curtis, where can the folks at home find you and all of your work? Well, as always, they can find my writing over at darkreading.com, and I will typically point to that uh, on Twitter at KG4GWA, uh, on Instagram, uh, and even over on LinkedIn. So look for me any of those places, um, and would love to hear from you. Give me a direct message on any of those platforms. Would love to uh, hear what you have to say about what we're doing and uh, hear your suggestions for future stories and future ideas, uh, both over at Dark Reading and here on Twyat. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Curtis. Well, also, we have to thank you as well. You are our loyal listeners and our followers, and we want to make sure that we make it easy for you to watch and listen to the show. So go out right now to our show page, twit.tv slash Twyat. There you'll find all of the amazing back episodes, show notes, information about our co-hosts and our guests, as well as links to those next to those show those shows and those videos right there, you'll help help find those helpful subscribe and download links. That's where you can help and support our show by getting your audio version, video version, or HD video version of your choice. You can listen on any one of your devices. It's really the best way to stay on top of your enterprise and IT news. Now, after you subscribe, share it with your friends and family and coworkers because we definitely love doing this show. With your support, we can keep doing it. Uh, of course, remember we do the show live each and every week. Live.twit.tv, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. Of course, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into the, tw- the to the chat room as well live and and deal with all the characters that are in there as well as ask some really great questions. We take a lot of great questions from the chat room each and every week. So check that out, irc.twit.tv. Also, don't forget, you can follow me at twitter.com slash lumm. 
There I post all the things that I do at Microsoft, as well as all the little projects I have on the side. And of course, all the great things I do here on the developer experience team on Office. You can check out dev.office.com, where that's where we post all the latest and greatest stuff to customize and expand Office. Now, I want to also thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week doing This Week in Enterprise Tech, and we thank you for their support. We couldn't do it without them. Also, thank you to all the engineers at Twit. And of course, thank you to our loyal producer and our co-host in crime, Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. He makes the show possible. He all, does all the bookings, the plannings. We couldn't do the show without him. Thank you so much, Chibert. And of course, before we sign out, we have to thank our TD today, Victor. Victor, you know, tradition, you got to keep going on. It's one of those things. What was today's show's topic? Oh, I got a good one. Uh, I learned a new verb, splunk. Like, I want to learn how to splunk my washing machine. <laughs> what else I can splunk? Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> splunk it. I love it. Yes. Splunk it. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, and I want to hear more of your Homer Simpson uh, voice. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did it better before. I don't know what happened. It just, it just got worse as I kept doing it. Oh, well. <laughs> Maybe next time, right? Maybe next time. <laughs> yeah, next time. And, all right. And until next time, I'm Louis Moresca saying, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Don't. Nope.